Today we are starting a series of sermons considering the ministry of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, in recent years, if you've been around, we uh, have covered the first few chapters of Luke around Christmas time, and we've covered the last few chapters of Luke around Easter time, and so we're coming back to sort of fill in the gaps a little bit. Um, we are going to take a closer look at what Jesus said and did during his ministry on earth. Uh, it, it's important, I think, from time to time for us to come back to this. For us as professing Christians to sort of recalibrate our faith around the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because I think we can easily drift into thinking that perhaps what we believe or what we do is what the faith is all about. Uh, but Christian faith is not just about truths to believe or morals to follow. Now, to be sure, Christian faith is very concerned with both of those things. It's concerned with uh, believing certain truths and doing certain things. But we don't believe those things for no good reason or do certain things just because it may seem like a good way to live. We believe what we believe and we do what we do because we believe the person who taught those truths and commanded those behaviors and we believe that he is our savior and king. So the core of our faith Christian brother and sister is personal trust in a person. And we can easily lose sight of that. And so for the next several months, we're going to take a long, close look at Jesus. Now, even that, I'll acknowledge that wonderful pursuit can be a little bit precarious. Uh, because when we consider who Jesus is, we all, I think, have a natural tendency to, to find the Jesus we'd like to find. Uh, if we're confrontational, maybe, and, and we're concerned that we see a lack of backbone in others, we tend to find a Jesus who's confrontational, does things like turn over tables in the temple. If we're empathetic and, and affirming, and, and we sense a deficit of those qualities in the people around us, perhaps, well, we end up finding a Jesus in the Gospels who is empathetic and affirming and who is love. Whatever we have a, a tendency to go looking for, I think we can easily fall into this trap of fitting Jesus into our mold. And so we end up with a Jesus made in our image instead of the Jesus who is, which is the Jesus we actually need. So... Uh, instead, we're going to go back to the gospel and get a fresh look at who Jesus is authentically and authoritatively presented to us in his word. Now, Luke begins his account of Jesus' ministry here in chapter 4 by recounting what happened one day in Jesus' hometown, Nazareth. Not because it, it happened first. Luke indicates it's, it, it didn't. This isn't the first thing that happened in Jesus' ministry. But he tells us this story right up front because it shows us the essence of what Jesus came to do and why so many people so often miss it. And the reason, in a word, and perhaps surprisingly to us this morning, that so many people miss it is familiarity with Jesus. Let's read it together. Luke chapter 4, I'll read verses 14 through 30. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year 
of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. This is the word of the Lord. I think familiarity can blind you blind me to the reality of who people are. I heard a a story recently about a college baseball team who was in South Carolina and they were playing a game against uh, a group of inmates from the local prison. And at one point, one of the college players was was called out by the umpire. And, you know, he made it clear how he felt about the call as he walked to the dugout. And when he got to the dugout, the coach uh, pulled him aside and said, hey, Don't argue with that umpire. He's doing life for murder. (laughs) Now, that's an important piece of information about that individual. This player had been around a lot of umpires. This umpire was different, right? Now, perhaps a more positive uh, example, one uh, I think many of us may be familiar with. Um, It happened here in D.C. several years ago. A violin player went to a D.C. metro station. He put out his case and started to play. That morning, hundreds if not thousands of people passed by as he did. Only very, very few stopped to listen. Uh, Even fewer put anything in the case. Uh, But it was later revealed that the man who'd been playing the violin in the metro all morning was Joshua Bell, uh, one of the greatest violin players on the earth. Uh, He was playing a 300-year-old Stradivarius violin uh, that was worth millions of dollars. He had completely sold out a performance nearby. But commuters on the metro hear buskers playing at metro stations all the time. But this was not just any busker. Well, in Luke 4, the people of Nazareth came to the synagogue and they heard a powerful message. But they didn't grasp what it meant because they didn't realize who Jesus really was. It was lost on them. They were blinded, in this case, by their familiarity. And so Luke takes this account, he puts it right at the beginning of his retelling of the ministry of Jesus to introduce us to four aspects of Jesus' ministry. I want to look at this under those four headings. The nature of Jesus' ministry, the claim of his ministry, the offense of his ministry, and the destination of his ministry. Nature, claim, offense, destination. So first up, the nature of Jesus' ministry. Right out of the gate, he gives us what really is an introduction to the next several chapters. Really, you could say this entire series. Verse 14, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And the report about him went out throughout all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So Luke tells us here, as his account began, that Jesus has already been ministering. He's already been at work. He is well known. 
in the region that he's in. But before Luke tells us what Jesus was doing, he wants us to know something about the nature of what Jesus is doing. And I would say that is this, that Jesus' ministry is especially a ministry of spirit-empowered teaching. That's the nature of Jesus' ministry that Luke wants us to see, that it is especially a ministry of spirit-empowered, you might say, proclamation. So verse 14 says Jesus had come to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Luke is showing this throughout his gospel. He wants us to see that Jesus carried out his ministry in the power of the Spirit. Just to quickly catch you up on the previous chapters if you're not familiar. Luke tells us that Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit. We celebrate that at Christmas time. The, the people who testify of Jesus' birth at that time, people like Elizabeth and Zechariah, Simeon and Anna, that all those people do that at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Luke tells us that Jesus' prophetic predecessor, John the Baptist, was filled with the Spirit. That, that same John foretold that Jesus would baptize people, not with water like him, but with the Holy Spirit. Then, lo and behold, Jesus comes along and Jesus himself is baptized. And in that moment, the Spirit descends on him like a dove. And after his baptism, Jesus is led into the wilderness by the Spirit. And in that wilderness, he goes through a time of temptation and testing by Satan himself for 40 days. And at the end of that time of, of temptation... Jesus emerges now from that spirit-led testing, in many ways as the true and better Adam, having withstood the lies and the deceit of the devil. And, and he emerges out of that wilderness as the true and better Israel, having withstood the temptation of hunger in the wilderness as he fasted under the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. And he arrives in Galilee not only having survived by the Spirit, not only having been led by the Spirit, but now it says being empowered by the Spirit. He will carry out the ministry before him in that power. So he will not only live the life of righteousness that Adam had not, that Israel had not, that you and I have not, he will live that life in the only manner it is possible to do so, and that is by dependence upon the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, quick side note here. If Jesus lived by the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit, so should you. If he walked by the Spirit, certainly we as his children ought to walk by the Spirit as well. But the larger point Luke's making here is that God himself, by the Holy Spirit, is driving the action. So as we come to Luke, we are not reading just haphazard accidents of history. They are events divinely ordained by the Father, divinely empowered by the Spirit, and divinely executed by the Son. And so Jesus didn't uh, just come out of his baptism and come out of the wilderness and decide, you know, I'm going to swing by the house. I'm just going to go home before I do some other things. No, Jesus is led in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And he did these things to show us that he is the one, indeed, sent by God to save us from the wrath of God so that we are restored to fellowship with God. Right out of the gate, Luke will not entertain the, the concept that Jesus is merely a guru, uh, that Jesus is just kind of another influencer here to help you gain some self-improvement. There is so much more going on with that, and God himself is driving the action. So Luke tells us this. This is a spirit-empowered ministry. He also tells us Jesus' ministry is a ministry primarily of proclamation. 
This entire chapter really is an introduction to this ministry. And the passage Jesus reads at the synagogue that morning that he says he has fulfilled references proclamation in every verse. If you go back and read it, you'll see it three times. And this whole chapter is enclosed by two verses about teaching. Verse 15, and he taught in their synagogues. And then at the end in verse 44, which we'll read next week, and he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Now, in between those two reports, we're going to see some miracles. Jesus is going to do some incredible things. And so you could ask, okay, Luke, what's the relationship between his preaching and his power? What's the relationship between his words and his works? What's this? His miracles authenticate his message. His power proves who he is so people will listen to what he says. But miracles by themselves, if you think about it, would have accomplished little. All the people Jesus healed eventually died. Every storm Jesus calmed eventually raged again. But the people who believed his message were changed for eternity. There's actually a cycle in the Gospels, and we'll see it in Luke, where Jesus does some wonderful thing. People come to him in droves. He starts teaching, and then they bail, right? Uh, he's got people following, and he says, hey, guys, let's feed these people. Got a few loaves, got a few fish, 5,000 men, who knows how many people total, all get lunch that day. Within days of his teaching after that, they're gone. They're there for the next lunch ticket, and they don't appreciate what he's actually got to say. We'll see that in Luke. And the same can be true today, friends. Christians can draw a crowd by serving the community. And we should, Christians, do good to the places where we live. But we're going to see right away that our message is often far less palatable. But it's our message, it's Christ's message, that truly transforms people's lives. Now, we can't recreate Jesus' miracles, but we can and we must retell his message. And as we do, the same eternal impact that happened in the lives of people in the ministry of Jesus can happen right now and does happen right now today. As Paul puts it in 1 Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's the message. So first, the nature of Jesus' ministry. I want us to know as we walk into this portion of God's word is a ministry of spirit-empowered proclamation. But second, Luke shows us the claim of Jesus' ministry. And again, to introduce us to all this, Jesus takes us back to the day, Luke takes us back to the day Jesus went to his hometown. I don't know if you can think about times when you go back to your hometown you ever go back and visit? Um, often it's the same place, but things have changed. Uh, and it can feel a little awkward sometimes. And sometimes as you walk some of the same halls or down some of the same streets, what you realize is that what's changed is you, right? Well, in the same way, Jesus is back in Nazareth. But now he's not back as the son of the town carpenter. He's back as the spirit-empowered Messiah. And one Sabbath morning, Jesus goes back to his home church. And they invite him to give the reading that morning and to say a few words, which was customary. And so Jesus picks the text. Luke goes out of his way to show us that. He gets the scroll and he turns it to Isaiah 61. Jesus wanted people to understand his ministry in the context of Isaiah 61. Now what Isaiah is prophesying in that portion of scripture are words of encouragement and comfort to Israel in exile. When they, due to their disobedience, have been permitted by God to be taken out of their land and into Babylon as a part of his fatherly discipline for his people. 
And Isaiah is prophetically looking forward to that moment, and he's speaking words of comfort to them. He's speaking words of promise that this exile won't last forever, that he's going to send a deliverer. So Jesus comes up, he finds that passage, he reads it, and then sits down, which, by the way, was normal. That's how they preached back then, sitting down. Sounds kind of nice sometimes. But, but as he does that, it says all eyes are fixed on him. Now, I don't know how Jesus read the passage, but he must have read it pretty well. Because when he sits, people are locked in and he says to this crowd leaning in with bated breath, today this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, the, the work I just described in Isaiah 66 that's what I'm here to do. Now, for us, on this side of Jesus' ministry, you might think, well, that's what we would expect, right? Yeah, of course, that's what Jesus was there to do. But if you think about that, is, that is not at all what Nazareth was expecting. The exile to Babylon has been over for centuries. Uh, that's, that's old news to them at this point. They're in the land of Israel when Jesus reads this. They're already back. So this would be like a, a politician today running on a platform of like winning the war of 1812. Uh, got that covered, right? Uh, that's, that's a long time ago. But Jesus is talking about a different kind of exile. He's talking about a different kind of bondage. And he's talking about a different kind of deliverance. He hasn't come as a a military leader to, to overthrow the government. He hasn't come as a, as a politician or a political figure. He's come as the savior of souls. And he brings his salvation to bear on the earth. And as he does, he has a special concern for a different kind of exile. The kind described in Isaiah 61 that exists in Nazareth and around 30 AD and it exists today. His eye is on the lowly of heart. He, he rescues the poor in spirit. He delivers those in bondage to sin. And throughout Luke, he will paint a picture of what's been called the upside down kingdom of God. A kingdom that works the other way from the way the kingdoms of the world so often work. A kingdom that starts with the lowly. And so Jesus will say, I came to call not the righteous, but sinners. And that fact is perhaps the greatest roadblock people face in trusting Jesus. We see it here and we experience it now. The only prerequisite for receiving grace is acknowledging that you need it. The only prerequisite for being able to receive the grace of God, to receive the things that Jesus is saying he's come to do, is recognizing you need it. That is extremely difficult for most people to do. It's hard because it's humbling. It's humbling to acknowledge that you cannot save yourself. It confronts our, our pride. But until you see yourself as captive to sin and unable to free yourself from it, you can't receive Christ's liberty. Until you see yourself as spiritually blind and unable to heal yourself of that blindness, you can't receive his sight. But when you acknowledge you're blind and you acknowledge you're poor, you can find freedom in Jesus. That's the same claim that Jesus makes to you and I today. The claim of Jesus' ministry is that he is the promised Savior who sets captives free. That message was just as confrontational then as it so often is now, which leads us to the third point, the offense of Jesus' ministry. Jesus' sermon on that Sabbath morning has basically two points as Luke gives it to us. 
You could call point one comfort for the troubled, right? All you who are blind and oppressed and captive, I'm going to set you free. Comfort for the troubled. Well, you could call point number two trouble for the comfortable. Uh, Jesus is about to start meddling, if you know what I mean. He's going to get in people's business in point number two. He is saying that he brings good news to the poor and liberty to the captives. And as he says that, he can perceive that he's getting pushback. Now, I don't know if he was doing this supernaturally. He could see into people's hearts or if they're actually kind of murmuring in the crowd and he picks it up. But verse 2 tells us exactly what was going on in their hearts. It says, and all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And then they said, wait a minute, isn't this Joseph's kid? So at first it seems positive. It says they spoke well, that they, they marveled. But it seems they're, they're more impressed with his words. They're more impressed with his ability to speak than when, with what he's saying. So some of these people who recognize Jesus and remember him as like uh, the guy who helped build their dining room table or came over with Joseph to install their kitchen cabinets are thinking, man, this guy's gone off and now he's back. And man, he can really read Hebrew. I mean, uh, he's really speaking some gracious words. Wow, what a, what a communicator. Then he said, you know, um, isn't that Joseph's son? And wait a minute, isn't, isn't, is he not just, he's not just reading Isaiah. He's not just talking about it. He's saying he's the guy. Like he's claiming to be the one that I, Isaiah said was going to come and deliver us. Well, this guy can, can talk, but I don't know about all that. <laughs> and then some people start saying, you know, I heard he healed some people in Capernaum not long ago. Words getting around about that. Man, I, I've had some back issues um, I don't care if he says he's the Easter bunny. He can come fix me up right now, and that would be great, right? Um, Jesus, uh, in your hometown, aren't you going to do a little of that? Aren't you going to do some of the stuff we heard you doing in, in Capernaum? Well, <laughs> Jesus picks up on all this, and he does not leave things as they are. Uh, he brings their hearts to the surface. And he says the things they're thinking out loud. Verse 23, and he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What you've done in Capernaum, do in your hometown now as well. You ever heard the, the slogan or the phrase, uh, familiarity breeds contempt? Uh, I think that's what's going on here. It means that the more familiar we are with something, the less we tend to like it. Uh, I experienced that this week, going to the grocery store with one of my kids, and there's a particular thing that, you know, for like a year, they've been asking every trip to the store, Dad, make sure you get this, right? As soon as it gets home, it's gone. Well, we're walking down that aisle in the store. I'm like, hey, buddy, you want, you want some of that? You, know, you want to get some of those? Oh, no. Man, I'm done with that. I've just, man, I've had enough of that. You know, the thing that we couldn't have enough of in the pantry one minute is like, don't even, I don't even want to see it, Right? Familiarity breeds contempt. Well, some of that is going on here with, with Jesus. The familiarity with Jesus affects the people of Nazareth in two ways. It makes them skeptical of his claim. We know this guy. He can't be that guy. And it also makes them feel entitled to his power. I think we live in a time marked by over-familiarity with Jesus that creates some of the same hindrances. Studies actually show that an overwhelming majority of people in our community believe in God. Like a massive majority of people would say, God, thumbs up. And believe it or not, Jesus has actually got a pretty good reputation around here as well. It's also a majority where people say, Jesus... Yep, thumbs up on him. But church attendance and Bible reading is at like a once in a century low, way down. And so if you think about that, what's going on in our community is we more and more have 
people who have all kinds of misconceptions about Jesus. They approve of a Jesus they don't really know, but they think they do. I think perhaps the most prominent in our day is that Jesus is kind and loving and therefore affirming of almost everyone in almost every situation. That he had some good moral tips for living a more just and peaceful life. But I think if Jesus parachuted today into Montgomery County, preaching the way he preached in Galilee, we'd throw him off a 270 overpass by the end of the day. His message would be just as confrontational as it was then if we actually had ears to hear it. But like the people in Nazareth, people would be skeptical of it because they have an over-familiar misconception of who Jesus is. If that's you, I'm so grateful you're here. Come back, we're going to keep looking at the real Jesus. But the second part, I think, hits a little closer to home. The Nazarenes feel entitled to Jesus' power. They think that because of their relationship with him, he owes them one. Man, I feel that one. Familiarity with Jesus can give the impression he's in our debt. Man, Jesus, I I was pure in my dating relationships. Why is my marriage so hard? Jesus, I have raised my kids the way I, I was supposed to. I think I've done it all right. Why are they not turning out the way I've been praying for 20 years they would? Man, Jesus, in my, in my job, I am diligent. I'm faithful, I show up on time, I do what's asked of me and more. Why do I keep getting passed over for the promotion? Why am I not moving up the ladder the way these other people who don't know you and don't love you and don't fear you and don't walk with you, that they all seem to be getting? And the, the, the subtext under all that is, Jesus, don't you owe me one. Friends, Jesus loves to do good but he can't be manipulated. He he doesn't do tricks. Uh, There's no like inside track with him, right? Where if I I get on this side of his, then, then I'm gonna get something in return. And Jesus will actually confront this problem many times in the gospel. He does it very graciously but very directly with his own mom at the wedding in Cana. But he wants us to see that he loves to to give blind people sight. He loves to set captives free. And he does that when those people come to him in faith. But he won't be kind of worked. He won't be put in our debt. Well, now that everything's out in the open, and Jesus has said the quiet part out loud to Nazareth, He confronts the unbelief that's underneath all that. And he reminds them of two stories in the book of Kings about the prophets Elijah and Elisha because they offer two examples of the same thing that's going on in Nazareth. Both of them were prophets rejected by Israel, just as the people of Nazareth are rejecting Jesus. Both were sent by God to then minister elsewhere. The Gentiles, Elijah to the widow in Sidon and Elisha to Naaman in Syria. Because in both cases, the widow and Naaman had one thing that Israel lacked. Faith. Simple faith. And what's implied from his the, uh, point two in his sermon is that the same thing is playing out now in his hometown. The people disbelieve. And as a result, Jesus will minister elsewhere. And so now, they aren't just skeptical, they're furious. They've gone from, wow, can't this guy speak well, to let's throw him off the cliff. Verse 28, when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. Why? Jesus does not put people at ease in their unbelief. He doesn't allow people to be content 
in their unbelief. And because he's good, the same is true today. When we, friends, are skeptical of the grace we need, the kindest thing Jesus can do is trouble us. When we're stiff-arming the grace and help from Christ that we need, the most kind thing he can do is trouble us. Jesus' ministry always has been and always will be offensive to human pride. But his grace will always has been, always will be available to the lowly, available to the humble who will come and say, Jesus, I need you. That's the offense of his ministry. Last, very briefly, Luke tips his hat to the destination of Jesus' ministry. Let me go back and read it for you, just verses 29 and 30. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. From the time his ministry began, people wanted to kill him. So the road to the cross begins at Nazareth. Right here at the beginning of Luke's account of Jesus' ministry, we already have a sense that he's not only being opposed, like run-of-the-mill opposed, people want him dead. Just as he passed through that mob, Jesus will pass through the grave. And we don't know how he got through the mob that day. We don't know if he just had some really good moves and kind of juked his way off the cliff um, or if there's a miracle that happens. But, man, we, we know how he escaped death ultimately. But by the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus overcame death, overcame sin, and rose in newness of life and now sits at the right hand of the Father so that you and I, lowly, poor, captive, oppressed, and blinded by sin, can have freedom through faith in Jesus. Right now, Luke is pointing us to that destination. But he also shows us there's only really two responses. And Luke right away is calling us to come down off the fence. We've got to pick. You can receive Jesus as one who is poor, as one who is captive. Nothing in my hands I bring only to Christ I cling and experience his salvation. Or you can continue to reject him as a skeptic, as entitled to his care, too familiar to receive the true and better freedom that he has to offer. Jesus sets spiritual captives free when he is received by faith despite familiarity. So right away, as we enter into this series, I want to encourage you, church, and those who are visiting with us, um, let's come with open hands and open ears and open eyes to see Jesus afresh. Let's lay down the preconceived notions that we have of him that actually may be the very things blinding us to seeing him and ask Jesus, would you come and help me to see you for who you are that I might experience the grace and power that's available to me. We're going to look at, uh, uh, take a close, long, hard look at Jesus. And I can promise you, he will not always be what you expect. He will not always be what you think you want. But he will always be what you need. So come to him. Turn to him. Find him today and in the weeks to come. Father, we pray that you would help us to see Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see him for who he is, for how he's revealed in his word. That you would help us to lay down our defenses, lay down our familiarity, lay down our skepticism and entitlement, and give us a glimpse of who he is, that we might know him 
and experience his freedom and walk in his power. In Jesus' name, amen.